from a, a, a set of books that date back into the 1800s. Uh, some of the uh, older uh, scholars were, these men had time to study, and they looked uh, into the scriptures uh, uh, in an investigative manner and uh, left us with a rich uh, uh, amount of material concerning the uh, prophecies. This, the guy that's the author of this outline is Dr. Arno C. Gabriel. He came, he, 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 he was of German descent, and he later came to this country, and, and uh, he was uh, uh, self-schooled, and later on, Wheaton College, you know, Wheaton College is one of the great men, mm -hmm. uh, gave him an honorary degree, and he is one of the original, uh, so far as premillennialism is concerned, and uh, in fact, he was so... Uh, rich in, uh, in uh, uh, prophecy that uh, whenever Sophia did his uh, 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 Bible and the first edition was 1901, I mean 1909, if you look at how Sophia Bible, if you look in the, in the front cover of the list of contributors, you'll find Dr. Arnold C. Eberlin. Uh, and he was such a mastermind in prophecy, and he had such a relationship with Israel. He, he, uh, he spent a lot of time when he came to this country uh, dealing with the, uh, the Hebrew people and made several trips to Israel, and he made prophecies uh, concerning the restoration of Israel, and he died in 1945. You know Israel became a nation in 1948. So he didn't live to see what he had prophesied, but just as the man outlined in detail. Not only was he a premillennial, he's a dispensationalist. And uh, not many people today will admit to being a dispensationalist. Dispensation by now I means a period of time, a definite period of time. I don't mind. To me, it, it's the most uh, uh, acceptable way. Uh, to it, uh, interpret the entirety of the Bible, the seven dispensations, you remember? I keep drilling all, starting with the Eden and going all the way through to the King. I've, uh, those of you that have been with me already on uh, Wednesday nights, as we studied Ezekiel and Daniel uh, and Zechariah, I spent a good deal of time pointing out the seven dispensations. If you don't have them in your Bible, you need to, to get them, uh, and uh, uh, I don't know if you have that in print anywhere. Uh, Patricia's got them all listed in her Bible, uh, several of you have, I can give them to you, the, 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 and will in the course of our study. The, 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 the identical and pre-flood and post-flood? Mm -hmm. All right, you've got, you got the identic, that's the first one. You've got the post-diluvian, Antediluvian, and then you've got the the, the uh, uh, prophet uh, prophets, and then you've got uh, law, and uh, and then uh, uh, grace, and then the final one is uh, the kingdom. All seven of them. Okay, uh, so Doctor Gibbon did not get to see, but he, uh, C. I. Scofield was so impressed with his knowledge about last events and uh, and the word that uh, that we want to use for last events is eschatology eschatology uh, and that means the study of last things last event and uh, he was so knowledgeable that Dr. Sophia just asked him to, to deal with all the prophetic scriptures in the Bible and, 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 and that's why he's such a strong contributor to the Scopia of Bible. Uh, and so, uh, along with the men that are in the uh, uh, front of the Scopia of Bible, uh, Arnold, uh, Arnold uh, Gableman and C.I. Scopia, uh, I was fortunate enough years ago to find some copies, original copies, of his works. And I studied them intently. Uh, and, and that helped me uh, to, to gain an understanding of, of, of prophetic events. Uh, 
Uh, he, he's just a master mind. I can say uh, uh, we the Goddess were so impressed with his knowledge of the Bible that they gave him an honorary degree. Uh, and so uh, uh, he's just a master mind. So right on top of this, so that we'll make sure we give him credit for work that he did back in the 1800s. Uh, Arnold C. Gabriel, he, he is the originator of this outline. It is very, very detailed. That was 1800s or 1800s? 1800s. He was born about 1846, I think. He died in 1945. He's almost 100 years old. Uh, okay, the other uh, copy that you have is four views. This is important. Uh, four views of the end time. Uh, normally I say three because uh, 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 the historical is uh, not talked about too much because of, of the position that they take so far as making the church spiritual Israel. And, and I don't see that. Uh, uh, I'm a dispensational premillennial. So I'm a millennialist uh, without looking at all this. Generally they believe in a general resurrection and a general judgment. That's it. They won't even they don't even bother to uh, uh, look at the prophetic portion of the scripture. They say that most of Revelation was fulfilled uh, in the Roman Empire. Uh, and so they refuse to look at it. Consequently, they just reject major portions of the scripture as far as I'm concerned. Post millennials, uh, they believe that generally that things are going to get better and better and then the millennium will be ushered in. Well, that, that's looking at the world scene today, I don't think it's getting better and better. The Bible says it waxes worse and worse, and then the end will come. And so uh, that's where I stand. I see it all going downhill. It's deteriorating at a rapid pace. So I, uh, post millennialism, that's pretty well proven not to be a valid uh, position on last things. So uh, your pastor is a, let me give it to you. I am a mid, I mean a pre trib not mid-trib, pre, a, a pre-trib rapturist. A pre-trib rapturist. I, I believe in the dispensation. And I am definitely a pre-millennial. So there are three things you need to keep in mind. A, a pre-trib rapturist. A dispensationalist, and then I believe in the seven dispensation. That's why I use the Scopia Bible because it it's just so great at uh, at dealing with the uh, uh, the various periods, seven periods in in the life of the world. Uh, and then of course uh, uh, pre millennials. Uh, I believe in the rapture. I believe in the tribulation. I believe in the millennium, and uh, I accept all of the prophetic scriptures and, and when you look at them in their entirety they complement they complement the pre-millennial position so you you will know I, I don't make any apologies I, I over the past 50 years I've looked at the various positions and, uh, and uh, I, I discovered that if you're going to believe in the inerrancy, the infallibility of the scripture, you're going to have to be a premillennial. All of the major evangelists that, that have impacted this country and the world are, are premillennial. Billy Graham was premillennial. W.A. Christian was a premillennial. Charles Sanders was premillennial. Or, or just about all of the, uh, the major evangelists and <coughs> preachers are premillennial because uh, it, uh, it gives uh, motivation uh, to, to reach people, try to educate people about what's going to happen uh, uh, to this world order and how God's going to come and judge and, and, and the rapture is coming and if, if you miss out on it, then you're in deep, deep trouble. So make sure you've got an outline and uh, the four views of the uh, last thing. The disposition, the disposition of pre pre millennial. Is that, that the one that you were That's the one I, on, I stand on, uh, pre millennial, a dispensational pre millennial. Now, I want to give you some words you need to write 
can use that, that paperwork that she gave you today. You, you need to write some words down. Uh, revelation. Revelation means, and, and, and uh, I'll point this out, but uh, revelation means uh, simply last, I mean, uh, uh, an unveiling. Unveiling, E-L-I-N-G, unveiling or uncovering. That's what the revelation means. This is the Greek word right here for apocalypse. Apocalypse. A-P-O-K-A slash L-Y-S-I-S. That's in Greek. The English of that is apocalypse. Remember when I preached on the four horsemen of the apocalypse, Linda? Yes, sir. Four horsemen of the apocalypse. That means uh, the four horsemen of the revelation. Now, I, I put these two up here to help you not to get confused about these. Uh, apocalyptic literature uh, covers all of the prophetic books and chapters of both Old and New Testament. We studied Zechariah, we studied Ezekiel, we studied Daniel, uh, and, uh, and, and this is a, called apocalyptic literature. Okay? Any any prophetic, Matthew 24, Matthew 25, the Olivet Discourse, all of these are uh, are considered to be apocalyptic because they are futuristic uh, uh, and and speak of uh, coming events. Now that's not to be confused with the apocrypha. The apocrypha, for those of you that uh, uh, have ever been exposed to uh, a Catholic Bible, uh, these are books between the Testaments. The 11, some say 11, some say 12. Uh, but uh, these are the books uh, in uh, their, that intermediate period between uh, the Old and the New Testament. Uh, it's basically uh, Jewish history. That's called the Apocrypha. So don't confuse that with these with Apocalypse. Uh, and so the Greek word for uh, or the English word, rather, for revelation is the apocalypse. Now, uh, let me point out a couple of things to you. Uh, in your Bible, does it say the revelation of St. John the Divine? Mm -hmm. All right. That's, uh, that's uh, uh, a little bit uh, misleading in that if you go down to the first verse, you, the real, the true uh, uh, message of this book is it is not a revelation of John, Saint John, or John the Beloved. It's a revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. See that in that's verse one. Right? You're so oh, that's very that's, that's great. Okay. How many of you? How many ever said that? Uh, a revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, please, uh, don't be guilty of doing this. So many people will do it, and it's misleading. Add an S on to it. It's not revelation. There's one revelation. One revelation, and it is the revelation not of John. It's the revelation to John of the Lord Jesus Christ. John is the messenger, and uh, the, and and it's addressed to the seven churches of Asia, Asia Minor. Seven churches. They are. He he instructs John to give this message to the seven churches. And uh, I'll show you over the course of our study when we get in chapter 2 and chapter 3. I'll uh, share with you the various periods. Scofield does an excellent job of pinpointing the exact time in history. So the seven churches cover the entire church age. And you know, if you're familiar with the seven churches, that the last one is the Laodicean era. And that's where we are right now. There's no doubt about it. When you when you look at what he says to the church of Laodicea, you say, well, that characterizes our day. 
uh, when the love of many is waxing cold, when uh, uh, there's such an indifference and callous attitude toward religion, toward the church, uh, I saw a uh, there was a survey done among millennials, and uh, you wonder where the young folk are. Well, the trend in America today is away from religion, away from the church. Uh, only, only 25 to 27 percent of millennials are at all interested in the church. That tells you where we are. And then the next generation below that is called the what? Generation X. And if they, if they are not turned around, then they're going to be probably worse than the millennials uh, as far as uh, desire for worship and service and, uh, and a part of the ministry of the church. So it's pretty obvious that we are living in the last days. The last days began in May of 1948 and have been rapidly moving toward the climactic event. Coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can see this. It's, it's, you just, just keep up. And that's why I enjoy news and world events because it helps me to tie it all together and come to the conclusion that, hey, Lord, you knew exactly what was going to happen in the end time. You already, you already spelled it out. I, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised uh, that what's, uh, what's happening. The Lord's already told us about it. And if we look at this book, you will, you will get a, a, an in depth. Uh, appreciation for, uh, uh, for the revelation. Any questions at this point? Okay, you got all these words fixed in your mind? I'm just going to make a statement because one of these quit on me and I had to start back. You said it should be revelation without an S, That's but right. you've got an S up on the board. It's the revelation it, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Not book. You just put the S up there for demonstration. <laughs> Not to use an S. After revelation. A B O C R Y P H A. Letter two.
Now, we're led to believe by Jewish historians that uh, after the uh, death of uh, Demetrian, uh, a Roman ruler, after his death, uh, John was released from the Isle of Patmos and he returned to Ephesus. That's one of the first of the seven churches of Asia Minor. And he returned to the church and he became a, a stalwart uh, uh, a servant there in the church teaching uh, the church of uh, that was exhorted to return to their first love. He, he taught them about the theme of, 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 uh, of the first epistle of John, which is love. Uh, children love one another. That's, uh, and uh, he was uh, blind at that time, and deaf appeared according to tradition on the Jewish history. But he came back and he spent his last year uh, exhorting the saints there uh, to this love. One another. And when you study this, that first epistle of John, you see that that truly is the theme uh, of John's epistle. Uh, he was the only one of the apostles at the crucifixion. He also, he also took care of, uh, of Jesus' mother. You remember the Lord told him to, uh, to take care of his mother? And the uh, Lord committed Mary to his fish. And so John, John also was, uh, uh, and most of the time you see these Lord's Supper scenes, the one that's closest to him on his left is John, John the Beloved, the disciple who Jesus was. And uh, you can understand how the Lord blessed him uh, by giving him an opportunity to be, to receive this message uh, while, in, uh, while being banished to the Isle of Patmos. The Lord uh, uh, gave him this, this revelation and instructed him to take it and give it to the seven churches of Asia Minor specifically. Now, say, so why should we study? Why should we take the time to study a book like this? Why do we spend all the time doing detailed uh, background studies? Why? Why? I'm going to show you why. We need to, to study the book. Let us in chapter one read verse three four. Yes, sir. It's three, this is a threefold reason. Threefold reason for uh, a threefold blessing. A threefold blessing for studying this book. Go ahead, Lynn. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it. Because the time is near. All right. The word blessed, we understand it means happy. happy. Mm -hmm. Do you have any translation say happy? Anybody? Happy. All right. So there, blessed are those, first of all, that do what, Linda? Read the word. Well, to read it. What's the second? Hear, hear the word. Hear. hear. You mean you can read without hearing? Yes. I'll do you that way up a lot on Sunday morning. <laughs> okay. No, All right. Yeah. Uh, okay, what's, what's the last? The time and is near. Keep. Oh. So the threefold blessing for those that read, those that hear, in order to really hear. About seven times to the churches, he says, he that has ears. Let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. How many of you have ears? How many of you have two ears? <laughs> you know why you have two ears? You should do twice as much listening as you do. Seven churches. 
Look in verse 9. John, also your brother and companion in tribulation. He's been, now go over to the last chapter, chapter 22, and look at verse 8. What does he say? What chapter? 22, verse 8. And I, John. I, John. I, John. Okay. I, John, what? Paul. Uh huh. This is not secondhand stuff, Miss Gail. He's just first hand info. Okay. So he's, uh, he's, uh, he's telling us uh, uh, that he is the recipient. Of this, uh, of this revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, and uh, so uh, uh, look at, now your outline, your outline uh, is, has three major divisions, and I'm going to show you where they come from. They come from uh, verse uh, 20. Verse 20. Look at it. Uh, yes, well, no, at verse 19. Uh, of, uh, of, uh, and, and take your outline now. And, and uh, Dr. Gabriel does a good job. Uh, and compare it to verse 19. Read verse 19, Miss Gail, in the first chapter. <clears throat> All right. Verse 19. Verse 19. Uh, write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Okay, so he's given us a threefold outline. You see it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The first, the first of uh, eight verses. Uh, I'm sorry. The first of uh, really the first uh, four, well, yeah, first, uh, you know, uh, down through all of, of chapter one. All of chapter one can be classified as things which thou hast seen. Okay? First chapter. First chapter, things which you have seen. John saw, first thing. All right? The second, uh, uh, Roman numeral two, has to do with the things which uh, the things which all see that, mm -hmm. and then after chapters two and three, beginning chapter four, things which shall be hereafter. So you, this this is the out. That's why I I chose Doctor Gabriel's outline because he, I could say, is the. Um, Prophetic mastermind behind the Schofield Bible, and uh, and he used used <coughs> three points. So the first uh, twenty one verses of basic well the first chapter has to do with the things that you've seen, John, uh, and then the things which are the seven churches, and then the things which come hereafter. So you know the basis for the outline basis for the outline that you have in your hand. How many verses in chapter one did you say? Twenty one. Mine wrong got twenty. Uh, yeah, twenty. That's right, you're right. <laughs> you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Twenty. Not twenty two, but twenty. And uh, I think uh, I think Dr. Gabriel says twenty one. He does. He says 21, but, uh, but it goes down to chapter 20. That must be a misprint somewhere along the way. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, uh, let me see what else I want to point out to you. It's in nine. Uh, we're going to take it. We're going to to uh, look at this uh, chapter by chapter. We're going to use the major divisions of your outline. And, uh, and we'll take it section by section. And when we get to the churches, I'll give you the dates of the period in history that these churches cover. Uh, 
And I want you to uh, uh, look at, uh, uh, let's see, uh, verse, uh, we see the, the uh, free existence of the Lord uh, in, uh, in verse uh, 18. Uh, and, uh, you, and then there's another place where we, in this first chapter where we see the uh, verse 8. Look at verse 8. Uh, let's see. Miss Fabry, verse 8. I am Omega, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith right. the Lord. Alpha is the first Greek letter. Mm -hmm. Omega is the last of the Greek alphabet, okay? And notice, notice the pre existence here of Christ. Notice the eternalness of Christ, which is, which was, and which is to come. There's never a time when the Son did not exist. You say, how do you know that? Well, in Genesis 1 1, turn over to Genesis 1 1 1. The Son exists not in his human uh, state, but he existed with the Father. What is his Trinity? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Son, Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit. Can you see that, Mr. Uh, Rick, in that black? See that word from my chest? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, Genesis 1 1. What does it say? <laughs> in the beginning. In the beginning, what? God. Okay, watch this. The Hebrew word is Elohim, which I am. Elohim. Which means from God. Now, you say, well, how, how do you know? What did, what did he say when he came to man? Let us. You see the plural? Let us create man in our image. Not in the physical likeness, but uh, uh, God is spirit. At this time, God the Father is spirit. God the Son is spirit. God the Spirit is spirit. Okay. When Jesus was born of the Virgin, a body was prepared in the womb of Mary. Jesus faithfully in his earthly name. Uh, and uh, and so uh, he said uh, concerning uh, who he was, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father also. I and my Father are one. So the embodiment of Jesus is the visible manifestation of God. Had we not had the incarnation, we would have not been able to comprehend God because no man can look upon God and live. But God veiled in flesh, we could understand. Okay? We could understand. In veiled in flesh, we can understand God. Okay, so when you get to heaven and you see Jesus and his celestial state, you will have seen God. All of God is incorporated in the body of the Son and Holy Spirit. We have one God who is manifest in three personalities Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Well, let me give you a simple example. In the United States, our Republic, one God. But we have a legislative, we have judicial, and executive. How many governments do we have? But there are three what? Different districts. So that'll help a little bit. But but God, but uh, when you see when you see the Lord Jesus Christ, you will have seen a visible manifestation. This, this is the Trinity is confusing to a lot of people. 
But this is a revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will see that he's very God. And that all of God is encompassed in the Psalms. Everything that the Father has done toward the world has been through the Son. Every activity toward redemption, salvation, everything is for a through the Son. Because He is the visible manifestation 